Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Freeport Sustainability Advisory Board lecture. This lecture is titled Smart Growth Strategies. And as our very esteemed speakers, we have Christina Egan and Logan Capone. Christina is the director of the Greater Portland Council of Governments, which is a regional plan and do agency that serves 30 cities and towns. The council supports road and public transportation projects, the region's transportation infrastructure, and it also promotes electric vehicles and clean fuels. GP COG also advances economic development for its member communities. Before joining GP COG, Christina served as a town councilor here in Freeport. She was a director of transportation for Massachusetts and the director of Massachusetts South Coast Rail Project and of the Massachusetts Smart Growth Alliance. Christina will speak about development trends in the recent past. She will highlight the tenets of smart growth and she will describe the benefits of smart growth strategies. Logan is an urban planner interested in creating a livable and sustainable public realm by planning places for people. At principal, Logan assists with planning, design and development projects, as well as with public engagement. Before joining principal, Logan worked in preservation planning for the city of Somerville in Massachusetts and she planned public events, managed public outreach campaigns, and assisted with the management of historical sites. Many of you might recognize Logan because she was one of the key point people for the downtown visioning project right here in Freeport, which is still ongoing. And after her presentation, she will give us some tips on where we go from here and how to stay engaged and keep participating. So Logan's presentation will be an overview of the Freeport Downtown's Vision Initiative, and she will share a quick preview of the smart growth ideas that fit into the vision for our downtown. Thank you both for joining us, and we're very excited to hear you speak. Thank you, excited to be here. All right, so Christina, you will go first, and Logan will follow you. So when you're done, you can just hand it off to Logan. Thanks so much, Valerie. It is such a pleasure to be here. Can you see my slides? Give me a thumbs up if you do. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you again. And it's a great pleasure, as I told Valerie before, to be able to speak to this group. Um, smart growth, which I'm going to talk about tonight, is really an approach to making sure we have walkable downtowns. We're able to preserve our natural areas. And in a way, just for tonight, I think of it as how we keep Freeport really special. Um, I was going to ask if I could see everybody, how many of you walked to school when you were kids? And I'm wondering with the speakers, how many of you did that? Maybe you could take yourself off mute or, or raise your hands. Did any of you? You did? Yeah. So yeah, thank you, Logan. Thank you, Valley. I did too. Um, I lived in a, in a house that was on a block that had a street that we could all play in, and I was able to walk to my elementary school. I know my mother told me that she used to... Uh, hide behind the lampposts as I was walking there as a, as a young kid, just to make sure I made it. But there was a crosswalk and there was a crossing guard and we went as a little group of kids there. And this is really what smart growth is. And what I'm gonna be talking about tonight is just about reversing some of the trends that have caused um, us to kind of become more disconnected from our community and more in our cars all the time, which maybe some of you can relate to because I've uh, driven my son around to many different basketball and and uh, football games to school to school and to other things. And so we're often in our cars. So I'm gonna tell you first just a little bit about um, who I am. You got the introduction on my background, but I work for the Greater Portland Council of Governments. I'm the executive director there. And just briefly to let you know our perspective on things, um, we work to help our cities and towns in the region collaborate and uh, do things that are really difficult for towns to do on their own. We also have been put to good work during the pandemic as being kind of a think and act tank, as Valley said, but we really respond to the different things that are happening in our rapidly changing world and provide our municipal members, our cities and towns tools to deal with those changes. So our, our mission overall is to create more shared and more sustainable prosperity for all of our residents. And I'll just start by saying Freeport is awesome. I love Freeport. It has everything here. A couple of pictures. This is a fun, you know, my son and some friends jumping off 
the dock at Buston's Island. And uh, my son and I out on South Freeport Road, bike riding, the Harrisicut River, Pettengill Farm. It has so many gorgeous places in Freeport. And then it also has like awesome schools and we have new fields and we have L.O. Bean who puts up amazing seasonal things like this uh, bunch of jack-o'-lanterns. We have great restaurants and we also have a bus and a train. So I moved here in the year 2010. Uh, I fell in love with a Mainer and we had the choice between Boston and Maine and I chose Maine. So I'm a person who's relocated here by choice. And since 2010, since I moved here, we have had the Downeaster extended. We've had the Breeze, which is the bus that has been extended north. We have a new movie theater. We have new fields for our kids. We have a high school renovation. Wolf Snack has gone under a huge renovation as well with new um, facilities out there. And of course, we've all got the Bow, which is just a fabulous place for our community to be, that re the revamped space for that. We have so much in Freeport. And um, I've lived in many places across the country. I've even had the fortune to live in cities across the world. And this is my favorite place. This is the, the place where I wanna be for the rest of my life. I love Freeport. And I'm sure that all of you who are on this line feel that way too. Um, what I wanted to talk a little bit today is about some of the challenges that Freeport is facing and how we have some really incredible opportunities ahead of us with the downtown visioning to make Freeport special forever. So, I'm going to first talk about this first challenge, which is um, retail. And even before the pandemic, there were businesses that were closing on Main Street. And now I would say Amazon is firmly landing on our Main Street. Um, there's been some evidence of struggle for a long time, but we know that as more and more people can just click a button to be able to get what they want in the mail, we are going to have uh, real pressure on the national chains to probably not be there forever. And so what is going to replace that? Um, and are we able to bring in new businesses that are local, that might occupy places that used to be national chains? Um, in order for that to happen, and I'll talk about this a little bit more, and I know Logan will talk about it, we're going to need to have more people, more activity in the downtown to be able to sustain more restaurants and local businesses. We'll need more people to live and work right in the downtown. So our first challenge is really dealing with the, the, the retail changes in the global market. The second challenge is that we are growing as a state. We're a slow growth state in Maine, but Cumberland County is growing faster than any other place in the state. And the greater Portland area within uh, Cumberland County is growing even faster than that. And in Freeport, while our housing prices have gone up, which I'll talk about in a moment, we still are a more affordable housing market than many of the other places in Greater Portland, which means, and I kind of visualize this as the marbles are going to be rolling towards Freeport for people to come here. And uh, again, I was going to ask how many of you know people who have moved to, to, to Freeport since the pandemic from out of state? Um, I'll raise my hand. I can't see any of you with your hands, but I know anecdotally there are people. Yeah, Valley, are you there? Are you going to raise your hand for me? So I think there are many people that have uh, started. Yes, thank you. <laughs> there are many people that have started moving to Freeport um, during the pandemic. And the other thing I just want us all to be aware of is that we also have extreme climate disruption that's happening globally. And uh, Maine is actually one of the safer places in the United States. When you look at the number of climate threats that are out there, I'm not saying we're climate safe. But I am saying that we have many assets, including water and some less severe weather and not as many wildfires, that, that, that our area, again, is going to be a magnet for climate refugees. So growth is coming our way, and there's no way to stop it. Uh, there's even an argument that we don't want to stop it, that as one of the oldest nations in the state, one of the whitest nations in the state, that it is great to have new people coming into our state. We have a workforce challenge right now. Uh, there are many more vacancies than there are people, and that's just one immediate indicator about why growth can be very positive for the state. But not all growth is not created equal. There are different kinds of growth, and we want to have growth in Freeport that makes sense for our community, is in places that make sense, and really reinforce our downtowns and make sure that we can keep our open spaces. So I, our, our second challenge here is that we have growth. I, I would say it's a challenge and an opportunity. 
The third challenge is that while we are more affordable for housing than many places, we are still not affordable. And the prices have been skyrocketing here as they have been throughout all of Maine um, and certainly in the greater Portland area. I have a couple stats here for you just to show home ownership on the left and rental income on the right, how much rental income has to go to um, housing. And just in the rental market in the last two decades, rents have actually doubled. And as we all know, incomes have risen much, much more slowly. slowly. The housing affordability problem, while it may seem a little abstract on this slide, is very real for all of us. I know when I was campaigning for uh, city council, town council, sorry, um, for in Freeport, uh, there were many doors that I knocked on where I heard from um, older residents, people who had contributed to Freeport many, for many, many years in different ways, volunteering, being in the schools, serving on council, other types of volunteer work that strengthen our community, needing to leave because their fixed incomes couldn't keep up with the rising property taxes. Um, to me, this is a real tragedy because these people are the folks that built us and we get to enjoy it, the next generation and the generation after us gets to enjoy it. Um, it so there aren't places, there aren't very many places in Freeport where an older empty nest couple can find an affordable place to live. And many of them are needing to be forced out of their houses, unfortunately. Um, the other ways that this impacts us is uh, those of us that have adult children. Um, mine is on his way, he's not there yet, but adult children, it's unaffordable for them to be able to really come back and find a home here. And then the last way, which I think we're all feeling is that people that make uh, just an average income aren't able to live here. And so if they work here, if they're police men and women, if they're fire people, if they are teachers, they are needing to move further and further away from Freeport to keep their jobs here. And uh, that results in them driving a long way and maybe finding a job in another school district. So these are issues that really affect our community strength. And a, a, I would argue that a very strong community is going to have a mix of different kinds of housing types that allow for people that earn average income and low income to live in their hometown or in the town that they work in. And I'm only going to give you one more challenge because I know this is a lot of challenge, but we have we have a shared planetary challenge around climate change. And I will talk a little bit more about how climate change is actually um, addressed by smart growth strategies. So I will come back to this, but I just wanted to note that we're all in this together. So while we have the specific Freeport challenges and opportunities, we're also needing to all lock arms and face this global challenge together and do what we can locally to uh, affect what's happening globally. So now I'll dive a little bit into smart growth and the, and the principles around that. Um, the first thing I'll say is, uh, you know, Smart growth, again, it's a set of principles that a lot of planners use in order for us to try to create livable, wonderful places for all of us. And this is just a picture of what, what does it mean in, 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 in downtown Freeport? How can we apply smart growth principles to downtown Freeport? And I'm just gonna share a few of them. The first thing is a real core of smart growth is when you have a vibrant downtown. And the key to a vibrant downtown is to have mixed everything, have mixed, um, uh, jobs, have mixed income, have mixed housing types. And when you have that, you create energy and you create vibrancy. And here are just a couple of pictures of it. I would argue that we still have a very vibrant downtown. It is uh, well used by tourists and it could probably be better used by locals if we had a different mix of retail and we also had some businesses down there and certainly if we had some housing. Another second principle, I should say, another principle um, that's really key is to preserve our natural areas. So if you're able to create very vibrant downtowns and you can direct and shape growth to those areas, it gives you more ability and flexibility to preserve the open spaces that are really beautiful. And in Freeport, we have a, an abundance of them. So, and we have, you know, the Freeport Land Trust, we have a lot of other groups that are working to preserve, but there is a constant kind of pressure for sprawl development, which can undermine um, our, our open spaces, particularly those open spaces that don't have um, significant natural value or are not already purchased for some reason. Uh, so it's more like those open space lots uh, that get devoured by uh, single family homes. 
The third principle is really around how we use our street space. Um, we have developed since the 1950s under Eisenhower with a highway investments. We've developed in a way that really prioritizes single occupancy vehicles over other users of the streets. Streets used to be a lot more mixed also, where you had pedestrians, you had cyclists, you had horse-drawn carriages, you had um, buses, you had trains, you had trolleys. Um, in Freeport, we don't really have much of this anymore. We have sidewalks in the downtown, but even on South Freeport Road, which Valley works, walks almost all the time, I walk quite a bit, you know, it's, it's not as safe as it should be, even though the shoulders have been recently widened. And it's certainly not a place where I wanted to take out my son when he was young on a bike um, by himself. You know, it's, it's, a, it's not that easy to get around in Freeport by foot or um, by bike without uh, having some risk that you're gonna get hit by an automobile. So when we think about what this could mean downtown is that we could share the space with cars probably more equitably, allowing more space for bicycles, more space for um, bikes. We do have a wonderful already, we have two really robust public transportation options in the downtown, both the down Easter as well as the breeze, and they are in those areas. And so there's already been quite a bit of work done around this, but we could do work to kind of slow the traffic and make it easier for people to walk and bike and certainly be able to connect other parts of Freeport more safely with walking and biking routes. And the last principle is really about our infrastructure. Um, having sat on town council and now working with a lot of other cities and towns, infrastructure is really expensive to build and it's really expensive to maintain. And the more you sprawl outwards, the more you have to deliver services as a municipality. Um, whether it's road maintenance and road plowing, whether it's emergency services, um, or if it's sewer and water. So these things are expensive. And the more that you kind of concentrate where you need that infrastructure, the more cost effective it is to the taxpayer. And here's a picture of what costs taxpayers more, especially when these roads are not privately maintained, when they become adopted by a town, this becomes very expensive. So this is the kind of development that's more expensive for municipalities and for taxpayers over time. So the question that I know Logan is gonna to try to answer for us tonight is how can we reinforce our downtown? And I wanna draw your attention to the left picture here, because when you take it, when you walk down the downtown, it feels like it's really completely built up. But if you're actually looking at it from an aerial point of view, you can see that there's actually quite a lot of open land. It's now devoted to cars for parking, but there's actually space that we could do some what's called infill development in order to increase the vibrancy of the downtown. Um, I would like to just do one note about climate change because I promised you I will and I think it's really important and talk to you about how smart growth relates to climate change because this is a sustainability group. So the way we grow and develop really impacts the amount of emissions we have and climate change doesn't affect everyone equally. In fact, I have a slide that I don't have up here today that shows you where there are people in Freeport that are in mobile homes and the concentration of it um, is out in North and West Freeport. The people that are in those kinds of homes are much more vulnerable to climate disasters. And so it's important for us to realize that as we're looking at climate change, we need to provide affordable options that are safe um, in, in, in this challenging climate that we're moving into. So the local zoning and the development is really gonna impact um, emissions. And I'm gonna show you just a couple slides um, that show why smart growth is a great climate solution. So this is a carbon footprint. Green is where there is less emissions per capita and, and orange and red is where there is more. So this is the big picture. And you can see a lot of the emissions are actually concentrated in the suburbs around, free, uh, around Portland. And I'm gonna zoom in just to show you some, what I thought was really interesting. Uh, you can see New York City right here. That is the greenest part um, of, uh, in terms of uh, having the lowest per capita emissions. And as you get out further, as people are commuting in and out, in and out, and living more dispersed from one another, that's when you get a higher per capita emissions. And I'll just show you up close in our area, you can see it's the same thing that you see in Manhattan, just on a smaller scale. In Portland, the Portland Peninsula is, the, is one of the greenest places, so is Lewiston. 
Um, and as you get into North Yarmouth and these and other areas here, you can see it's more red. Freeport's actually in pretty good shape here. And that's because we have a vibrant downtown. And we've done a pretty good job of preserving open space and, and building in kind of more clustered areas. So when you think, I'm in, the, I'm in the business of thinking about this as a region. And um, number 25 up here is where Freeport is. And we have identified at Greater Portland Council of Governments about 27 different places where it would make sense for us to concentrate more of our growth in order to, well, first of all, in order to welcome more people to our region as they're coming in, but also as a strategy for taking pressure off of our open spaces. And the downtown of Freeport is one of the places that we think is very prime for good development, good smart growth development that will help with this strategy. Unfortunately, most of our region is not zoned to allow for multifamily or denser types of housing. And you can see here, there's only 5% of the land that really allows it and encourages it. And I'll show you, we just finished a study, this is hot off the presses, of what Freeport looks like for zoning. And you can see that in Freeport, there are more limits and many limits to multifamily housing. What you've got is just right here, the downtown, where there are limits to, to, to housing. So you can build it in certain, certain circumstances, but it's not really encouraged or easy to do. So this is an issue that Freeport has, but it's shared by all of your neighboring communities. And what, what this adds up to is that we have zoning that favors single family housing throughout the entire region and makes it's really difficult for developers to develop in the downtown areas that are served by infrastructure and can really reinforce our downtowns and accomplish smart growth. This is my last slide, which is just to say that multifamily housing can be beautiful. And this is, uh, this, I can't remember how many units, I think this is six or eight units, and it fits the character of um, Freeport or other towns around here. So we can accomplish the multifamily housing in the downtown in a way that fits who we are, reinforces kind of our, the designs and the character that we have of our buildings, um, and also starts to help us accomplish some of the smart growth principles that we need in order to make sure that our downtown stays vibrant and our preserved areas stay beautiful. Thanks, Valley. Thank you, Christina. Logan, you, you have the whole screen to yourself now. Thanks okay, so much. Awesome. Let me pull up my slides. Thanks, Christina, that was really great. I think you did a good job of framing the challenges and I really also appreciate the, the regional perspective that you bring. Um, let me just go ahead and share my slides. All right, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Awesome, thank you. Um, so I'm here tonight to talk about some of the ideas um, from the Freeport Downtown Vision draft that we're developing and continuing to develop. We just came out of um, Downtown Design Week, I'm sure a lot of you know. And so I really encourage everyone to go and watch that final presentation if you haven't. Um, I'm not gonna talk at you for an hour, so there's no way that I can communicate all the ideas that were presented during the course of Design Week and in the final presentation, but I really encourage everyone to go and watch that final presentation take the exit survey and continue to comment on the mirror board. I've been getting, you know, people still engaging and that's awesome. So please continue to do that. And at the end of the presentation here, I'll, I'll touch on how the, on the process moving forward and how you can continue to stay involved. So like I said, I'm just going to talk about a few ideas related to smart growth um, in Freeport. And the first is to really foster a distinct, distinctive and attractive community with a strong sense of place. And these are the ideas that when we asked Freeport residents, you know, what should Freeport be like in 10 years? And what should not change about Freeport in 10 years? These are the ideas that really came to the top. And so we've begun to frame the vision around these big ideas and vision statements to make downtown a real New England village center with housing, to make downtown walkable and bikeable and reinforced and accessible as well, um, to promote sustainable growth, to embrace the outdoors and the connections to the outdoors and the amazing natural resources that Freeport has to offer, really building a strong local business ecosystem in Freeport 
and supporting the arts and culture event. Like Christina mentioned, you know, we need to, as retail trends shift, we need to continue to um, adapt downtown to be more experiential. So one of the um, ideas that came out of that, of downtown, of, of downtown design week was where can we make opportunities for public art downtown? Um, and so this was just kind of a draft of where public art might go. And that, that goes along with the idea of creating um, a strong sense of community. Um, and the other idea that I wanna, I should have had a slide for, but I wanna bring up to the group is I think that community events around sustainability can also be really powerful. And one of the ideas that came up in the early action plan that unfortunately nobody's picked up and implemented yet was um, a, a town bike ride. And you know, I've seen this take place in other, in other places and it can be a really great way to get people that might not usually bike around Freeport um, out, out biking with a group, you know, in a, in a controlled, safe way. Um, and I think that, you know, art events and community can really go a long way in, um, in fost and, you know, promoting sustainability and smart growth and just spreading awareness and bringing the community together. So one of the other values is to, is mixing land uses. Um, we can see from this map of existing land uses. I know that some of these, um, as some of you have pointed out, you know, have live, like live units on them. So, but in general, for the most part, this map is accurate, that there's mostly commercial uses downtown and not a lot of multifamily housing, you know, integrated into the downtown. And one of the things we overwhelmingly heard was that we need more housing downtown. Um, so that leads us to what type of housing do we want to see downtown? And so we talked about this, the idea of missing middle housing and what types of housing that we have in Freeport. And I think the idea here is not necessarily that everyone, that we need to change our zoning so we can only build tiny homes and compact units, but the idea that there's a range of options for people so that we can attract and, and support people aging in place or young people that want to move to Freeport that, to have an opportunity um, to start to have a starter home. So I think it's the idea that we have to look at Freeport and, 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 and try to incentivize a range of housing options um, that we don't necessarily have right now in downtown. So when we look at how does this actually start to take place, we sketch some of these ideas. Um, a, a different housing options of what infill development could really look like in Freeport. And um, overwhelmingly, I think people liked the smaller scale um, design with smaller storefronts that just feels more human. So how can we, as we continue to go through this process and develop recommendations, how can we make sure our zoning supports development that, that looks like what the community really wants to see here? And you can and you can just see you know how it affects how the different building types really affect the character of the street. These big storefronts um, feel way less human scale than than this type this type of, of development. So it, it, it overall contributes to the character of downtown. So the other idea is to create walkable neighborhoods. And Christina mentioned this. Freeport has. And a, a very walkable downtown. And that's something that we heard overwhelmingly from the community to keep it walkable. So I think we started to look at this from a few different angles. Um, really to, to, so we have a walkable fabric of downtown. How do we make it even more walkable, support multimodal transportation downtown and more accessible um, for all types of, for people of all abilities. And then there's also the idea of if downtown is walkable and we continue to make it walkable, um, how do we make how do we can how do we make walkable and bikeable connections to other parts of Freeport? And so this map just shows um, the five minute walk shed in from Freeport. So so this is really only these areas are really only a five minute walk. So I think I think we already know this, but it just um, reiterates that point that the downtown is quite walkable. There's a lot that you can access in a short walk from downtown. Um, and so then the idea of, well, how do we expand the connections to downtown? So there's kind of these arms leading to other parts of Freeport, South Freeport, the waterfront this way, and um, you know, up to the library, we heard that connection is really important. 
So how do we make, the, how do we look at those streets? And that's something that we'll be doing over the next few weeks um, to really make sure that the connections to downtown are walkable. And, and then there's also the aspect of off-road paths and trails. So not only, you know, making our streets feel safer, but connecting um, people off-road for recreational trails. Um, so just giving people a range of options uh, to support and encourage behavior that's more sustainable, um, like biking and walking places over taking your car. Um, and, and as Christina mentioned, when we, create a vibrant downtown and build infill development, we're able to preserve Freeport's natural um, spaces. And so this is one of the things that we also looked at during design week. And this was a quick sketch, this is gonna get cleaned up, but just how can we continue to build that fabric of you know, a networked green spaces downtown? And there's already some of these existing, like the Lana Town Hall, um, but can, and, and Discovery Park, but how can, as we continue to develop downtown, how can we make sure that our open spaces are preserved? Um, can we create new open spaces and enhance the existing ones um, so that we really, we really embody the value of embracing the outdoors and having open spaces downtown where people can hang out? And as people um, build here and move here, I think that those spaces will be really uh, important to the quality of life of downtown Freeport. And that leads us to the variety of transportation options. As Christina mentioned, Freeport is well positioned that with the um, Down Easter train and the Metro Breeze bus service. And so some of the ideas that came out of Design Week were how can we utilize these assets that Freeport has? Um, and so this is a map of just the existing multimodal transportation infrastructure. So we can see there is some, but there could potentially be more bike racks, um, uh, shared vehicles. So these are just some of the ideas that came up during design week, a shared bike system throughout town to encourage people that might not necessarily like own or be able to afford to buy a bike, but still want to have that option. Could we strategically locate shared bike stations downtown? Um, and, and to those arms connecting downtown. Um, a town of Freeport bike rental program, something a little different, but same idea. Um, how can we make it accessible for people um, and, and affordable for people to choose um, biking and build more bike racks downtown and integrate it in a fun way um, that represents the character of Freeport. And then also improving the bus, the bus stop locations. Um, it, you know, visibility, lighting, uh, you know, comfort. These are all things that, that help support, like I said, um, sustainable behavior changes for people. And also locating a zip car downtown. This is the idea that people can, people shouldn't have to have a car to come to Freeport. So can they get on the Amtrak from Boston and rent a zip car and get around? I know that, you know, from my personal experience coming there on the train, I can really only, like, it's not that easy to get to South Freeport um, or other parts of Freeport. But if I had a zip car, I could pop around and um, it would definitely be, be easier. So that's one of the, one of the recommendations that came out of Design Week that I'm a supporter of. Um, and so this is just, you know, the idea of directing development towards existing investments and what that could look like for, for downtown. So this is a proposed site plan. I think that it will continue to be edited, um, as we finalize the, the vision plan here, but just, um, imagining how that infill development looks, like I said, how we're preserving the open spaces and, and creating new ones. Um, and then also, you know, embodying the arts and community. This is the idea of the shared marketplace where there could be farmers markets. Um, so, and, you know, a development down by the train station. So this is just our proposal of what, um, you know, from the community's ideas of what downtown Freeport could look like and another of what that infill development could look like on Depot Street. So I think the question becomes, you know, um, as we continue to go through this process, if this is what the community wants to see, how do we adjust our, our regulations um, to make sure that we're getting this type of development? 
And so some of the things that came up during design week um, that are still need to be vetted and worked out with the community are timing, you know, is the um, approval process too long? Um, parking minimums, we've heard a lot about parking and just it being complicated and aligning and consolidating design review. You know, if we can make uh, development predictable and quicker and save, you know, uh, time, can we incentivize people to come and build here that are going to build the right type of development that the community wants to see? And if we, we you know, continue to, to work with community partners, I think that there's a lot of, you know, great things that can, can happen for Freeport. And then continue to have community conversations like this. I think that it's amazing that there are so many people in Freeport that are thinking about climate change thinking about how to be sustainable and live sustain sustainably. And I hope that our, our final vision plan really embodies those values um, and, and sets Freeport on track to becoming you know, a model sustainable town. So thanks everyone. Um, next steps for the downtown vision process. I've updated the website, so this is reflected. There has been some changes to the schedule in the past couple of days as we recalibrate after design week. Um, so the next open house will be April 9th. We're trying to do that on the lawn at Town Hall if we get a nice day and really make it more of a, a community block party event. Um, we, you know, maybe we can try to get a food truck and some lawn games and really make this fun. So save that date, don't go out of town, tell your friends um, and we hope to see you there. And then we'll also have virtual office hours. So if you can't make the downtown uh, or the, the open house downtown, you can come to virtual office hours and visit us that way and share your ideas that way. We'll also have opportunities for engagement online, surveys and the mural board as always. There will be two town council workshops um, where we'll be working through some of these ideas with the town council. And I think that there will be um, an opportunity for the public to ask questions in those sessions. And then the final plan presentation and adoption will also be a town council meeting on May 3rd. So thank you everyone. I really appreciate being here um, amongst this great group of people. It's been really fun uh, and a great journey so far. And I'm really looking forward to, to our next few months together as we get this plan over the finish line. So thanks everyone. Thank you very much, Logan and Christina for joining us this evening. So we'd love to take some questions. So if anyone has questions, you may write them in the Q&A bottom of your screen, or you may raise your hand and I will call on you. So questions can either speaker. So while we wait for people to warm up and send a question, I have a question in it regards, um, it's in regard to development outside of the downtown. How do communities encourage people who would otherwise want to settle outside of downtown to move into town, say, if they have a large family. Other than all the things that Logan described that make the downtown attractive, but there's some people who will want to be outside. So the question is, how do we either convince them to go into town or what are the options to make the development outside of the downtown a little more sustainable than it otherwise would be? So I'll pipe in first and Valley, I think you're, there are always going to be people that are going to live in single family homes and, you know, they're not to be criticized for it. I mean, it's a choice. And, and when you have a yard and you want your kids to play and, you know, it, it's, it, it's a choice that people will make. What the market doesn't produce right now is options downtown um, and smaller. So there's actually like an artificial cap on the production of these kinds of choices of smaller places um, uh, that may be in multifamily areas. And that's because I showed you that zoning map. Most municipalities encourage single family housing. And what it means is that people that would like to live downtown in smaller places just don't have the option. So I I'm a fan of thinking about this as how do we create the options that the market is not creating by changing the way we zone and plan in municipalities to allow for the market to perform for us and create more affordability.
Did you want me to add? I think that was a good answer. <laughs> um, and I, I would also say, you know, as Freeport continues to plan um, comprehensively, I think there are opportunities to, to understand how we can incentivize um, multifamily development downtown and provide those options, like Christina said. So I think that there's also opportunities with the comprehensive planning effort. And I just realized that I didn't really address like how you can do it more sustainably in the out in the out place. I, I live on Cushing Briggs Road and the way that it was, this area was originally developed, it was like small little camps that were along the water. And as time has gone on, those camps are being torn down and larger houses are being built. And that's what happens with that story I told you about one of the doors that I knocked on. Um, her house was like surrounded by two really large houses that went up on either side and it made her property taxes go up. And so that's kind of a trend that we've seen along the coastline, not just in Freeport, but in lots of other places. But I think that there is an opportunity and the legislature right now is considering some bills that would you know, encourage um, you know, a, a couple of units maybe on what a, a single family lot might look like and it'd be more, you could do it in camp style, the way kind of traditional main camp style would look like, and you could have some smaller homes. And we have neighborhoods like that in Freeport where there are smaller homes, um, but there is this, with the housing prices being what they are right now, there's a constant pressure to try to build, you know, bigger and bigger to get more profit, which is, which is why I think you can change some planning and zoning for the downtown that would allow the development and the, the dollars, the private investment dollars to go to a different area. Thank you. Excellent. I'm going to bring uh, Kristen on. Kristen, you'd like to ask your question? Hi there. Um, yeah, so at what point in the process and who um, would do the work around deciding what the distribution is, say in the downtown development, um, you know, whatever that square mileage is, in terms of how much housing to build, within certain um, you know, price ranges, how much commercial, how much retail, how much just you know, businesses that would you know, provide good paying jobs for individuals. How is that determined when you're starting to kind of map out what will go where and how much of what and, and that sort of thing? Um, my question at one of the visioning um, workshops was, you know, how many people is it that we want to attract to the area and how many people who are already here that are having difficulty affording to stay here or finding the type of work they need or the services they need? How, where and when and how does that, do those, you know, um, algorithms or matrices or whatever, how, how are those developed to um, promote, you know, whatever it is, you know, that it makes it economically feasible, yet sustainable, um, all that, all that good stuff. Christina, do you want to take that first? Uh, I, I could try. Okay. Um, so Kristen, first, hey, good to see you. Um, see you. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, you know, I think what, what the town is able to do is kind of build the framework with its planning and its zoning and its ordinances, and then the market comes into play. And so, the, you know, it's kind of a dance. I would say it's like a dance where the community can say what it would like to see. The town can do its best to build the framework to foster that. And then you have development proposals that would come in and could show you what's possible within that framework. Um, so, you know, Logan might have a more specific answer for the downtown of Freeport, but, you know, my, my guess is that we would need, you know, some significant new numbers of people in the downtown in order to support local businesses and more cafes and, and you know, uh, replace the retail that's been mostly um, national, you know, big stores. With something more local, we just need a we just need more people, and so then the question becomes: Can we fit those people in that area? Can the town design the free the, the the framework that can fit the number of people that we need to support that kind of economic development, 
in the area and do it in a way that is designed and Logan showed those like three iterations of the sketches, like designed in a way that feels like it's reinforcing what we love about the downtown already. Um, but my guess is that, and I, I haven't run the numbers and I'm not a private developer, so I'm not exactly sure, but my guess is that we have the opportunity to actually welcome a significant number of people into the downtown. Logan, what would you add to that? Yeah, I, I would agree that it's not an easy question to answer and it's kind of, um, it's, it's gonna be in flux because it requires a lot of different stakeholders, the town, the community, but then also good uh, community partners. And so when I think, you know, answering the question of how many people do we need to bring downtown, when we look at the existing population density, it's really low. There's only about like 300 people living in downtown. So we know that there's opportunity for growth and there's, you know, um, different research or thinking around what the right population density is per square mile. But I think that's, that's kind of besides the point. Um, but I think that, you know, there are ways to understand how development would impact like um, the community services. So there's, there's studies like economic impact studies that we can, we can see, well, if we built out this many units in downtown, um, how does that, how does that impact um, our overall, you know, town services and our schools and, and things like that. So there are ways to, to dig into that um, after, after having some, some proposals um, and ideas of, you know, what, what downtown could look like. So that could be, you know, a very viable next step um, for the downtown to understand, okay, well, if we did this, this much density, um, what would that impact, economic impact be on the rest of the town? So there are ways to understand that, but it is a very complicated question to answer. So I hope, I hope that helps. Logan, you just triggered another uh, point for, from my perspective is that you know, Freeport has long had economic diversity, but as the housing prices increase, there's more, more and more pressure for displacement and we could become a more homogenized town that's higher income. And one of the th opportunities I think we have with Vision Downtown is to look at how we encourage the development of affordable housing. And again, Kristen would be like, what's the framework that the town can put in place that would encourage it? And frankly, the thing that really makes the numbers work for private developers is allowing for density. Um, when you allow for more units, it allows them to still make a profit, but um, offer units at below market rate, which is basically what you have to do in this market in order to allow them to be affordable. I'm oversimplifying it, um, but over, overall, if we want people that are average and lower income in our communities, we're gonna to have to find ways to allow for some density. Can I just ask one more kind of uh, question about that? Has it already been done um, to, to sort of identify how many people are already here that need help? Uh, in terms of being able to afford either to stay where they are or downsize um, and, and find more affordable housing. Do we already know that? Because my sense is that's who you should service first is make sure we keep the people here who have been here for you know generations um, and kind of maintain the diversity instead of, you know, um, you know, booting people out and then trying to get them back again. You know, them, you know, people that have been here for years, but then also the young people that are graduating and wanting to come back, but either just can't afford it or just can't find work. Um, you know, are those numbers, do we already kind of have a sense of that? So um, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, Kristen, but on GPCOG's website, we have something called community profiles. And actually, while Logan, while Logan answers this, I'll see if I can pull it up and, and share my screen. I have no promises. But basically, it's a community profile, and it shows basic, it doesn't show exactly where people live, but it gives you the sense of how many families in every community in Greater Portland is cost burdened by their housing. Um, and that will give you some idea. You know, what we do know is that um, 
when we look at the housing numbers and you know our data always lags and this has been such an unusual time in history that we don't really understand exactly what's happened during the pandemic and as we look forward and we think about climate migration like we don't know what's going to happen in the future it's really hard to look at historic data and do any predictions right now i think on anything just because the world has been turning upside down for us right but i do think we do know that for a long time there's been not enough units within the greater Portland region to meet the needs of, of people in, in greater Portland. Statewide, there are, I think, 20,000 people that need um, affordable homes. So we know some of those people are in our communities. So Logan, I'm gonna go see if I can find something on a website for Kristen. Great, yeah, but I think that's a great answer. And, um, you know, there, there, I was nodding along when you said it's, with the data we have, it's a puzzle to understand really projections into the future. Um, but there are, you know, studies that can be done. One of the, one of our recommendations um, that's come about is to really do an in-depth market analysis and report to understand how much housing the downtown could support, um, how many people, as you said, are in need of affordable housing. Are we keeping up with um, the numbers of affordable housing that need to be built? Um, so there, there are, you know, economic development or analysis firms that, that do this work and can give us clear answers. Um, and that's something that we can recommend that the town invest in that type of study to really get um, a stronger understanding of those numbers. But I think in general, um, we understand that, that there needs to be more options, you know, um, aff affordable, you know, like naturally occurring affordable options as well as um, subsidized affordable housing and, and the balance of the two. Um, but in general, we know we need, we need more housing, I would say downtown, um, but it is a puzzle to get to an exact number. If that's... Uh, Christine, are you ready? Otherwise I have another question I can take if you want some more time to work. Oh, Sorry. Yeah, uh, I'll share something really quickly and then invite people to, you know, peruse around on this website. Um, let me see if I can do this easily for you. So um, this is at uh, gpcog.org and we have something called community profiles in our data library. And what I'm going to show you, well, let me, I guess it won't let me do that. Um, it, this will show you like the rental affordability index. There's some other things that I can't seem to scroll uh, very easily, but it will show you how many units of housing we have in Freeport, um, how many low income people we have in Freeport, uh, how, what, the, what the average price of home is, et cetera. So Kristen, I'm happy to talk to you sometime offline about this, but do take a peruse around the website and it'll give you some good data about Freeport specifically. Thank you very much. So I've got a question from uh, Pascal Del Sol asking, is there a place for tiny homes, probably mobile time, time, tiny homes that might be seasonal in this revisioning of the downtown? May CSA farmers now have tiny homes. Oh, my CSA farmers now have tiny homes and I can imagine them living near their crops in the summer, but moving to a downtown lot in the winter time. So tiny homes did come up, um, and I think that that's something that we need to continue to look at. Um, and if you have, you know, recommendations about where tiny homes should be permitted and, and where they should go, you know, comment, send us, send us an email. Um, but that is a, that is something that came up over the course of the the downtown vision pro, uh, design week, and also, you know, how can we build smaller smaller units, allow for building smaller units in the downtown that the zoning doesn't currently allow. And tiny homes might be a great thing to have outside of the downtown as well in certain areas that have infrastructure already. Um, you know, to Kristen's, uh, I think it was Kristen's earlier question about uh, where outside of, oh no, valleys, you know, where outside of the downtown could there be some development? Any further questions from anyone? Not seeing any hands. Oh, one hand. Yes, Mary Ellen, would you speak? You should be good to go. 
Okay. Uh, hi. One of the things that there was a lot of uh, discussion of in one or two of the um, sessions that I attended uh, for the vision was, was what do we do about parking? And that there's so much parking density that there can't be people density. Uh, but it's, you know, some of it is because it's zoned that way, how many square feet you have as a as a, um, a merchant or a business or something like that means you have to pay money for or rent space or own the space yourself. At least that's what I understand that that may not be actual. Um, and is there any way we can use parking um, to sort of start the ball rolling, either to start making the parks or start, um, you know, like I, these ideas are all wonderful and they're all so problematic because they're all tied together. But can we break out of something and just start something somewhere? And I realized the, the vision is ongoing and we're working on it and all that kind of stuff. But I, the more we talk about it, the more I think, oh, we'll never solve this. Um, so help me not think that. Yeah, so I think that one of the tasks that we um, are continuing to do as we write the vision plan over the next few weeks is really understanding implementation strategies. I think that we've heard that loud and clear from not only residents, but the town councilors, you know, um, this is all great, but how do we begin to implement this stuff? Um, so that's definitely a question that we're exploring and hoping to continue to answer. Um, in terms of parking, you know, there are ways that, that you, we could look at downtown and, and start to charge metered parking to start to fund some of these strategies. So we'll definitely make sure that there's, um, that, you know, when we're, when we are framing our action statements and recommendations, we always try to look at how it could be implemented and, and answer that in the plan. So stay tuned, I would say. And we're working on it. <laughs> you know, and there's different strategies like tips and, um, like I said, pay, pay for parking, um, you know, state and federal funding, DOT funding. Um, so there's a, a lot of different strategies that we're, we're looking at and, and, you know, hoping to provide the town council and residents of Freeport kind of a menu of options for, for how um, the, our strategies, your strategies can be implemented. That answer your question, Mary Ellen, anything else? You yes, want? thank you. Um, I, but please don't make us pay for parking. That's, one of, that's why I don't go to Portland to speak for any kind of arts or um, activities because it, it costs me more for the parking than it does for anything that I'm going to do there. Uh, and it's an asset here. So if we can just make that very limited, that would be my desire. I spent a good couple hours in Portland today and had to run into three different shops to get some quarters. Um, we've got one question, last question up, unless anybody else wants to add anything to the Q&A or raise their hands, please do. But this question is from Clover, the Yellow Lab Greyhound Mix, uh, asking about a dog park. Just in general about a dog park. Yeah, this idea came up um, a lot and we did, I did show that open space map earlier where we were exploring a couple locations for the dog park um, that people pushed back on a little bit. So we were looking at some other locations like up by the middle school. So maybe a little bit outside of the downtown. So that is something that um, will be a recommendation of the plan because the community has spoken loud and clear that we want a dog park in Freeport close to the downtown, so. All right, no, and only downtown. Well, Clover will be very happy to hear that. <laughs> uh, well, next question, we've got Mason Morfitt. So I'm gonna, Mason, you should be able to speak. And some other locations like up by the middle school. So maybe a little bit outside of the downtown. So that is something that, um, okay. well, I think I yeah. the community Sorry. has. Uh, <laughs> Mason, you've got the recording. The uh, there's, the there, there's somebody already talking. Because I think you're watching it online or on television. Very happy to hear that. Right now, I'm watching it on Zoom. Uh, next question, we've got Mason Morfitt. So, I'm gonna, Mason, you I, be able to speak? I was wondering whether. Uh, and some other locations, like up by the middle school, so maybe a little bit outside of the. Okay, it's just the Zoom has a lag. That's why it's 
catching up. Okay, you should be good to go now. <laughs> Mason, you've got the recording. Uh, there's, there, there's somebody already talking. I think you're watching it online. I'm watching it on Zoom. I'm watching it on Zoom. Wondering whether. Uh... Zoom has a lag. That's why it's catching up. Okay, you should be good to go now. I'm wondering whether the principal group will be producing an estimate of the economic feasibility of the plan. I think you're watching it online. I'm watching it on Zoom. Okay. Did um, you get that? I'm asking about the feasibility of the plan. Yeah, Mason, I think just with the lag on, I think you're watching it. I don't know. It's so hopefully that's enough, but we can bring you back on for another question if you Susanna, what was the question? Uh, about the feasibility of your plan. Uh, this uh, is the, uh, yeah, so we can and we will, you know, provide an idea of how much um, everything will cost. We that is something that that we are looking into. I think, and it's the lag, I think you're watching it. I don't know. It's so hopefully that's enough, but we can bring you back on for another question. Okay, Logan, go for it. Um, yeah, like I said, um, we are exploring implementation strategies and how the ideas could be implemented. And with that comes comes cost. And some ideas are no cost or very low cost, like hosting an annual town bike ride that would only really need a police service and, and people to come out and, and support it. Um, so, you know, some very low cost interventions to some major street redesign um, that could cost you know millions of dollars to 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 actually implement so we will be looking into um, not only how much things will cost but how they can be implemented and then what funding strategies that town has available like I said whether it's a TIF district um, whether it's paying for parking which we don't seem to like very much or um, you know looking at state and federal um, uh, monies that are available to towns. So, so that is something that we're looking into, um, and I, and we will be exploring in the vision plan. Okay, does that answer your question, Mason? You have to unmute yourself again. So, Susanna, do we have any more questions? Yeah. Um, I. No, we've got a reaction from Clover who says woof to the dog park. Um, and then thank you, Clover, for attending the lecture. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And uh, thank you, everyone, who showed up to listen to Christina and Logan, our wonderful guests. Thank you so much for coming to provide all this great, actionable information and data that we can mull over tonight and hopefully stay engaged and then go to the town council and advocate for all of these wonderful strategies for smart growth that we all want for our town. So please don't let it end here. Continue to be engaged and continue to participate as Logan said, April 9th. Don't forget that date. And as we move forward and this plan evolves, we will need all voices to be heard. So stay, stay in. I uh, also wanted to remind everyone that we will have another lecture in March. And if you're on our list, email list, you will get an email saying what it is and time and date and all the details on how to join. And if you have any questions for Freeport Sustainability Board, you can always email us at freeportsustainability at gmail.com. And this lecture that we just heard, in addition to all of the prior lectures, are recorded and they can be viewed at our website and you can access our website by going to the town of Freeport website, which is freeportmain.com and then click on the tab for sustainability and all the links are there. You can also just go straight to YouTube and type Freeport sustainability and you will get all the recordings, including Logan and Christina. So thank you so much. And we hope to see everyone in March and thank you to our wonderful speakers. You've done a great job. Thank you. See everyone again soon. Pleasure to be here.